he would tell her, if we can go six months without you bringing this up, then I'll propose to you. Welcome to From Betrayal to Breakthrough. I'm Dr. Debbie Silber, and today's guest is Dr. Zoe Shaw. Dr. Zoe is a licensed psychotherapist, author, motivational speaker, podcast host, life coach, and fitness fanatic. She's a mom to five and a wife. She's passionate about helping women who struggle in difficult relationships, especially those sometimes difficult relationships they have with themselves. After 15 years in traditional psychotherapy practice, Dr. Zoe jumped off the couch and now helps women using a different modality with a mix of virtual therapy, coaching services, and programs through a lens of psychology, faith, and a dash of feminism designed specifically for for women struggling in difficult relationships. So maybe you heard the saying, always a bridesmaid, never a bride, but have you heard the term forever fiance? What is that? And how do you know if you are one? How is that linked with codependency and fear? We're taking it all on during this very insightful conversation with Dr. Zoe Shaw. You're going to love what she shares. Here we go. Okay, everybody, we're with Dr. Zoe Shaw today, and we are talking about, get ready, what it is to be a forever fiance, and we're going to be talking about codependency too. So if you are in either of those positions uh, and situations, you're going to get a lot out of our conversation. So welcome, Dr. Zoe. Thank you, Dr. Debbie. I'm so glad to be here today. So let's just dive in. What is a forever fiance? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. So My definition of forever fiance is a woman who has had a relationship with a guy, they get engaged, and a year later, there's still no date. There's, it's just blurry. She's not really sure what's going on. Things just continue to get put off, put off a year or two later. That's when she's starting to enter the territory of forever fiance. Mm, Okay. And, and we have, you know, mixed couples and and everything going on so this could be this could be you know whatever gender or whatever so and and I also want to make a point that that is when the person wants to get married that they are expecting a date to be set because sometimes honestly some people get engaged without a real intention of getting married they feel like it's a bigger commitment and maybe they ex- like the excitement of engagement so you know the forever fiance is really um, about a person who really wants to get married mm-hmm. and they are now stuck in this land of being engaged, you know, being engaged, but the wedding still seeming like it's very far off if at a, ever. And, and I imagine like this could even be one of those things where the, the other person is just sort of like fine and they get engaged just to get them to stop asking or, or talking about it. Is that, that is sometimes if we want to look at the reasons why that happens. Yes. That is one of the reasons why that happens. And that is, you know, I think, I think that's, that's the most frustrating case for a woman because it's, you know, she got to a point where she thought there was a commitment level there that really wasn't. And it was really a woman or a man. It was really the attempt of the other partner to kind of assuage them and just kind of let, you know, them not talk about it anymore. Yeah. And then, and I can see after a while, you're sort of in this weird limbo place. You know, I I just got this visual of, oh, this is going to show you how old I am, but, but like being on hold, right? right? you're you're just like on the phone and you're just on hold. And it's like, wait a second, what, what am I supposed to do now? You know, I'm stuck. That's exactly what it feels like because there's the hope and there's the idea that this was supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. And so you can't move forward in another area of your life because you've now committed that you're going to marry this person. And yet now this person is dragging their feet and now, you know, it's, it's not happening. And that's just one of the worst places to be. And many people feel very stuck in that space. Yeah. And at what point does it turn into, you know, the, the difference between, well, it just takes a lot of time to plan and, you know, maybe we have to save up money for the wedding or, you know, our future to, uh oh, nothing's happening here. Is there a time? Well, you'll know. Yeah. You'll know you're in that time period when, like I said, the year has gone by, 
No date is being set because the other person is not willing to set a date. And so if you sit down with your partner and you talk about, okay, maybe finances, okay, you know, maybe, you know, family stuff or maybe this, if you can identify what it is Mm -hmm. and you can set a plan for it moving forward with a date, then you're in a better space. If you cannot get a date out of a person then unfortunately you have probably entered into that land of forever fiance. And it's a, it, 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 it feels horrible, but the best thing you can do is acknowledge what's going on. Yeah. So the acknowledgement is, is key. And, and I get it. You know what you said, if it's those other factors, let's say money, then it's like, okay, well, how do we make That's this work? Plan. Like, exactly. for example, I rented my wedding gown which right. I thought was the most brilliant idea, yes, <laughs> you know, yes. because I figured, well, who knows if, if I'll have girls one day or if they'll even want it and whatever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so it was, it was definitely a financial thing, but you know, ways to work around it, but it's more like when, when the date isn't being set. So tell us, because I know, I know my amazing audience. They're like, well, what do we do about this now? Very good question. Well, I think the first reason thing is to figure out what's going on. So what what is the reason why we've gotten here? Is it that, number one, the other person has changed their mind and aren't really willing to acknowledge it? Is it that maybe the other person never intended to marry you to begin with, but kind of wanted to shut you up, Mm -hmm. but wants to remain in the relationship? Um, Is it a family issue? Is it, like you said, a financial issue? So the first thing you need to do is identify what's going on. Mm -hmm. And you know, part of the way that you can do that is by asking the questions. And the problem is, is that when, and this is where we get into the codependency part, when people get into a relationship and they start to feel insecure, right, then they start to have these desperation kind of this energy and they start to approach it from a place like that. And so when you do that, then what I hear from people is, well, I'm scared to say this because they'll get mad because they'll get defensive because then they'll say, well, this is why we aren't married because you keep doing this, this, this. And so the first thing you have to do is recognize the energy with which you're approaching the relationship. And that is from a place of value. So I value myself and I also value this relationship, but I am not going to sacrifice my whole self for the relationship. And I, I just want to stop you there because I can imagine so many people saying, well, they, they're just nervous. They're just whatever. I'll try to help them. I'll try to heal them, fix them. Well, I always say that your your relationship should not be your charity cases. And I think it's important to have charity cases and we should have that in our life, but our romantic relationship should not be that. And I'll tell you a little story just to kind of illustrate this. This happened in my life. My husband and I got engaged. We set a a date for a year later after our engagement. We were a week away from our wedding. Now, this was probably just cold feet, but he actually tried to back out. He thought, I'm not ready. I don't think I can do all the things. Now, of course, inside, was I freaking out? Of course. We had everything planned. People were flying in from all over the world. (laughs) Um, But what I said to him was... I understand. You don't have to marry me. I will not wait for you though. So that's a choice you're making. I we're not going to end this and then me wait until this some uh, you know abstract time that you're going to be ready. So your choice. I put it right back in his hands. Mm-hmm. We were married a week later. But I also know that if I had said, okay, let's just wait, let's cancel it. And let's, I could have been a forever fiance. My husband probably would have been fine to stay together with me because he didn't want to lose me. He just wasn't sure about the commitment. You know what, Dr. Zoe, I just have to bring this up because I see this so often in the betrayal community right here. The difference between like, let's say there's a betrayal and it's, I see the same, the same thing happening, very similar in that here's the betrayal. And that's the time where it's like something drastic has to change. Right. But so often I see that the other person is afraid yes. to make a bold move. Yes. And so they just tolerate, they try to turn the other cheek, they try to put it behind them. And there's no real consequence 
where somebody really has to dramatically, drastically do something different. And because of that, that's the kiss of death right there. It is that's the reason why those repeat betrayals happen. That's the reason why nothing changes. And that's the reason why the person who's been betrayed suffers physically, mentally, emotionally, all of these things. And it sounds very similar in that here's, here's the opportunity. Here's the moment. It's right. very hard, but in standing your ground, you're, 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 you know, you're valuing yourself as well. I love that you said that because that's so true. And that brings us to the next thing, which is ultimatums. Mm -hmm. And so many people have an issue with ultimatums as if it's this negative thing, like how dare you give me an ultimatum, right? I think that ultimatums are the most beautiful thing if you are able to actually follow through on it. Mm -hmm. then it really just becomes a boundary, right? So if we're looking at ultimatums, what you should never do is say something that you are not willing to follow through on. But in the world, we have ultimatums. You run a stoplight, you get a ticket. Mm -hmm. You know, you you know, things happen. You don't pay your mortgage. I mean, the reality is that they exist and they also should exist in our world. And so a lot of people will say, well, it's wrong to give him an ultimatum. If I tell him, if we don't get married, that I'm going to leave them, you know, what kind of ultimatum is that? And once again, I talk about the fact that you are making a rule for yourself. He gets to choose what he wants to do. You are choosing how you want to live your life. And if it is important to you to be married, that matters. And if he's there, he or she is not the one yeah. to be a part of that, that's their choice. And it, it sounds like just based on what you said, when the way you, you said that the reason why someone wouldn't want th that wouldn't want to say that ultimatum or that consequence for that action is fear. It all boils down to fear. And when, when we allow ourselves to not speak our truths because of fear, we lengthen our pain yeah. because it's not going to change. It's just going to take longer for you to get out of it or for it to resolve or for whatever it's going to happen. Often people think that speaking the truth creates the pain. It doesn't. All it does is let you know for sure. And it's actually a gift. What's going on. If he's there, he's going to be there. If he's not interested, you're still going to figure it out, but maybe you're, you're five years down the road. You know, this again, I'm going to tie this back to betrayal. It's the same. It's a very similar thing. It's that fear of, and I hear this a lot. Well, I don't want to be the one to break up the family. I don't want to be the one to have this chaos and this shakeup. They're not the one. They're not the, the betrayal one. caused the shakeup, just like exactly. the person who couldn't commit or whatever. That's what caused the problem. The fear is in reacting to it, in responding to it, in taking action right once it's been created it's so it's so similar but fear really seems to be at the root of it it is and you know for someone listening out there i want to honor that it's not a little thing mm -hmm. that fear yeah. is usually very deep rooted it comes from rejection in childhood it comes from having to work and hustle for your value you know and and your early development it comes from a very real place and so I don't want to just say oh you just have to get over the fear you do you have to walk through the fear you can't expect that you will ever get over it before you approach the person and often people will do that as well even with women who are are wanting to divorce from a partner they want to they want it to be okay first before they announced the divorce and no, you have to walk, you have to walk through it. And the walking through is hard, but that's also the gift that you give yourself. And that's how growth happens. You know, when you think yeah. about it, how do you, how do you grow and how do you gain confidence? It's by, you know, here's the challenge and you do something with it. And it's, it, I always, you know, see how, what we feed grows if we feed the fear, it grows bigger. If we feed the next evolution of ourselves, well, that grows bigger. And that fear is going to be there. And I think so often what we do is we just retreat. It seems too big. And the only cure for fear that I know is action. You know, it's so interesting. It just brings up, I, I have four kids and one of them is very bold and she just always moves to these different countries and wow. goes to school there and lives there and figures out how to make it work. And it's just, she's living a very incredible life. 
And so often, and I remember when she was younger, she was like, she would talk to people about it, about where she wanted to go or what she wanted to do. And they would say, oh, that sounds so scary. Don't do that. Mm, yes. And meanwhile, it was in moving past that very moment of fear, mm-hmm. that's where the confidence came from. And it sounds like with what you're saying, these are the moments when that fear comes up, it's the make you or break you moment. Right. Is there a way or is there something you recommend to, to, you know, I don't know it's, if it's like make the fear easier, because I don't know if you could even do that, but something to sort of push you up forward when the fear is saying, oh, no, 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 just, just go retreat. Well, I think part of it is getting really clear about what you want and whether it matters or not, because also what I've heard is a lot of people in this situation get into a place of other people saying, well, why are you pushing it? Or, you know, just wait and see what happens. Or marriage is just a a piece of paper and people start to doubt themselves. And so when you're doubting yourselves, it makes the fear even bigger because you wonder, am I making a mistake? Should I just be okay with what is? And that comes back to questioning yourself. So I think you really need to write down what is important to me? What is my priority? Why is it a priority? And learn how to honor that regardless of what anybody else's is, because it's okay if your partner's priority is not marriage, but it also means that maybe you guys are not the people for each other. And so that's the thing that you have to really start to really go deep and figure out your priorities and value and honor them. And it helps you stick up for yourself when you're very clear about what it is. Yeah. And, and, and it's so, it's so true. You know, we're so swayed by the people we speak with. Here's where you have to be so careful who you share your information with, because it's coming from their lens. Like, think about it. Let's just say it's, you know, your, your partner and you, you, that person isn't, you know, setting the date or whatever. And then imagine your it's your future mother-in-law. And so you speak to her about it and she's like, oh, don't worry, don't worry. You know, from her lens, she just wants to give her child space. And yeah. so it's, it's so, or your friends who maybe have had a bad experience with marriage or whatever, they're like, oh, no, no, don't, you know. So you can really see how it makes so much sense to be so careful who yeah. you speak with like this, because especially if you're on the fence Those naysayers, those doubters will confirm every fear you have. But Dr. Debbie, sometimes it's the partner Mm. and that's another issue. I had a, I had a client who's, this was a guy that was never going to marry her, but he kept stringing her along because he really enjoyed being in the relationship with her. Mm -hmm. And he would tell her, if we can go six months without you bringing this up, then I'll propose to you. Or then I will, we'll set a date. I think is what it was. Cause he had already proposed and she would go six months and then she'd bring it up and he'd say, I was just about to, now we need to go a whole nother six months because there I need to be the one. And he was just stringing her on, but it made her doubt herself. And all along he would say the things like, you know, it's just a piece of paper. Why are you making a big deal about it? So sometimes it's the partner. And so sometimes you have to really shore yourself up and question as well, what's going on in this relationship? Is it healthy for me? Or am I entering into something that's probably not healthy? Yeah. So how did you work with with this person and how did you get them to, to see that? Well, she eventually got out of the relationship and she is now in a healthy dating relationship, but she had a lot of fear because she was... 33 or something. And, you know, her biological clock was ticking and all of those things. And it was really a lot of talking about her priorities. We looked at red flags. We mm-hmm. looked at, at what her priorities were in relationship. We looked at his history. One thing I always tell people is that when people tell you who they are, you've got to believe them. We know that's a quote, but it's really true. And often what we do is we we impose our own wants and desires on someone. So if they say something like, I don't think marriage is important, what you hear is, I just have to convince him, right? Or if I'm good enough, or he just hasn't met the right person and I'm the right person and we have to be careful. And so we would actually look at the things that he said and try to take them you know, out of the context of her lens of really wanting this and say, these are his words, you need to believe them. 
And, and, you know, this reminds me of, I remember years ago working with someone who she was married and she desperately wanted children and he didn't. Now he was honest from the beginning that he did not want yes. kids. And she was convinced she would change him. Of course, of course. And all she did was just get older. It, it mm-hmm. nothing nothing changed. So, so the, and then, you know, the, you, you've invested years into this relationship and like nothing is happening. So let's talk, let's go back to codependency now, because I see that so often in relationships, take us into a relationship where there's, there's a lot of codependency there, whether on one side, both sides, and what can someone do to recognize it, do something about it? Yeah. So, you know, one of the hallmarks of codependency is this idea of if he or she, my partner, is upset, sad, angry, we are. Mm -hmm. It's this inability to separate your own emotions from the others, which also then creates an inability to separate your own desires, wants, um, you know, your own kind of just independence from the other person. Um, And that plays out in your life. And so let me, let me go, let me go back because I want to talk about something that people can do or are possibly doing if they are in this forever fiance kind of situation that is hurting them. Mm -hmm. And this does kind of go into the codependence. So when you are in a forever fiance situation, what often happens is you become the spouse. You act like a spouse when you're not. So people will buy houses together with this idea that, okay, if we buy a house, then we'll, he'll commit or she'll commit, right? People will have children together with the idea that that will make the person commit. People will create businesses together. People will, you know, become the wifey or the husband kind of, of person. And actually what that does is reduces the partner's desire or, or motivation to marry you because you are already doing all the things. And that is really hard for people to pull themselves out of that when they've gotten themselves into that very codependent type situation. I won't call that interdependence. It's interdependence when you have a reciprocal commitment, but when you don't, it's you trying to bend over backwards and create a pretzel to be what that person wants you to be so that hopefully they will accept you in the way that you want. Um, so well, you can really see that you can really see where the, here's this, this person's like, well, they'll be more comfortable if we do this and we'll be that much closer. And, and you can really see how that can completely backfire because it's, it's, if the intention and the desire is to get married, it's completely reduced the incentive. What's the Absolutely. incentive at that point? Wow. Yes. Yes. And I forgot, I actually worked with that one woman. She moved out of the home because they were living together and they were working on buying a house together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about the fact that she cannot put herself in that situation unless he's ready to really commit. And so she moved out and they started living separately. And ultimately, you know, she ended the relationship and it needed to happen. And he finally admitted that he was never going to marry her, but that came later. Um, So she saved herself from that. Um, But yeah, so the actionable steps that you can take are to begin to look at, am I acting like a spouse to this person already? And if so, I need to stop those behaviors that are spouse-like because I'm not a spouse. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to have that communication too. I realize that this is what I'm doing, but we are not actually married. And so unless or until that happens, I'm going to stop doing that. And it's perfectly okay to have that conversation. Yeah. You know, so much of this, and and I'm hearing what you're saying, it has so much to do with these conversations and getting clear. And although the conversations are uncomfortable, nobody wants to have them and scary and life altering, possibly, isn't it better just to know what you're working with? You know, I think we think, well, time will just take care of it or if I ignore it, it'll just go away. And if you notice, it follows you around like a shadow and it doesn't. So we're almost better off just having these difficult conversations in the best way we can. It can be clumsy. It can be awkward, but at least we know what we're, what we're working with. So take us to now someone who they've had this difficult conversation and they're healing from it, they're, but but they're like, I don't want to go through that again. Is there some sort of preventative thing they can do or what do they do so that they're different going forward? 
and future relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Part of it is speaking your truth from the very beginning Mm -hmm. and not doing the thing. Like you said, the guy doesn't want to have a kid. Then guess what? That's the time to move on. So I talk to, especially women who are in this dating phase, you need to approach dating from a space of number one, social, the, the dating apps are crap. We all know that they are junkyards, but sometimes Often you can find gems in a junkyard if you're willing to go through all the junk. Mm -hmm. And that's what dating needs to look like. You're not putting all of your eggs in one basket. You are literally thinking about the line of men that will come through your app or your just meet you. And you're just going through them and sifting through them. And you have to have a very clear red flag list and a very clear desire list. And you need to adhere to it. The reason why you create that list before you start dating is because no emotions are involved. And when the emotions start getting involved, unfortunately, our thinking just begins to deteriorate. Um, And so we have to commit to ourselves and love ourselves enough to create these lists, adhere to them as soon as you can, because the longer you stay, the more emotion gets attached. And that's when it gets harder. If you leave earlier, it's easier. You know, I love what you said, love yourself enough to create the list because it's so true. I can see someone who doesn't uh, feel they're lovable, worthy, deserving, whatever. They're like, well, you know, I'll just take whatever comes along and they're just destined for like, how could that possibly be a good relationship? And this always gets to, and everybody who listens, watches our show knows, I always talk about the, you complete me thing. I I can't stand that. Um, Where It's like, I'm a half and let me find another, another half. And then for a time being, I'm whole. And then what happens? I And then that there's a breakup or change. And now I'm back to being a half again. The more whole you are, then you, you know, uh, you can't help but attract another whole and together you're a power couple. So I love that. Love yourself enough uh, to create the list in the first place. And then, and then without the emotions, that's when it's easier just to find someone if they're not a fit, you know, you don't find them and, and and that works out too. Any other, any other tips with that? Well, I also like people to write down what their role is. What is your role when you're dating someone? What is mm-hmm. your role when you are a girlfriend or boyfriend? Mm-hmm. What is your role when you are engaged? And what is your role as a spouse? All four of those roles should look different. And sure, you need to figure out what that is. But if those roles do not look different, then that's part of the problem. Yeah. Okay. So definite roles for each. And and this doesn't mean I'm, I'm assuming this doesn't mean, well, yeah, I'm just all, I look good. I'm doing all these things. And then I'm a fiance. I don't have to try as hard. <laughs> and then a spouse, I don't have to try at all. That's not, I I'm know. imagining Dr. Zoe, that's not what you're saying. No, not at all. No, okay. it's, it's really understanding what is my place. And because when we talk about those, the halves, I love how you talked about that. If you come into this relationship, assuming feeling as if you're half and this person completes you, the entire relationship is you needing to make sure that you don't lose that half. Mm-hmm. And then there isn't a healthy interdependence that even exists because remember, it's not just about getting the guy. It's not just about getting married. It's having healthy relationships for a lifetime. And so, yes, you have to be whole as much as you can and as healthy as you can and working on that journey to come to the marriage in a healthy way. Right. Oh, that's, that, that makes so much sense. And the healthier we are going into it in knowing who we are and knowing the value we bring just the better quality person we attract anyway. What do you want to make sure everyone knows as we start to wrap up? That past to the fear is really good health is just health. And it is scary to say the hard things. And you know, the other thing is that 90% of the things that people worry about in these conversations never happen. It's never as bad as you think it is. A lot of the fear doesn't necessarily have to do with this relationship. A lot of it is rooted in your own childhood issues. And so I know the fear is there, but recognize that most of the things you fear won't happen and past that fear is the really good stuff. I love that. And you know, when you, when you really take a look at it and you think about fear, if everybody listening, everybody watching, uh, just imagine, take a look at 
how fear has stopped you right. in so many ways. What has it stopped you from doing, from being, from, from having, from how has it stopped you from showing up, from ending something, from starting something, from pursuing a, a, an interest of some kind? Fear is like at the root of so many of the reasons why we do something or we don't do something. And, and it can really truly hold us back. And if we manage it, propel us forward. Where do we go to learn more about you and the great work you do? Ah, um, you can find me on Instagram at Dr. Zoe Shaw. Join my newsletter. You can go to my website also drzoeshaw.com and get some encouragement and tips for difficult relationships. That sounds great. Dr. Zoe, this was so helpful. And I'm sure so many people are taking a look at, at if they're in, you know, a codependent type of relationship, or if they are that forever fiance, hopefully you gave him a gentle little nudge. I was going to say kick, but we don't want that. A gentle little nudge <laughs> just to let them know. All right. You know what? It's, it's time to do something a little bit differently. So thank you for your wisdom and your insight. We appreciate you. Well, thank you for having me. So much of what we do and don't do is based on fear. And as Dr. Zoe says, fear lengthens our pain. And she's right. It doesn't change anything, just delays the inevitable. Stay in touch with Dr. Zoe by following her on Instagram at Dr. Zoe Shaw. And we'll have all of her information in the show notes at the pbtinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Here's my biggest takeaway. One, the first step to change anything is by acknowledging if you're a forever fiancé is the reason family, financial, or is your fiancé not really interested in getting married. Two, recognize the energy of both of you and come from a place of value. As Dr. Zoe says, your relationship shouldn't be a charity case. Three, give an ultimatum and follow through. An ultimatum isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's for both of you. Four, find out what's important to you. What are your priorities? Five, are you acting like a spouse already? It may be confusing for you both. Six, speak your truth and love yourself enough to create the list of what's important to you and don't settle. Lots of gems there. And if there's an unhealed betrayal that's getting in your way of feeling like the amazing person you are, let us help. Go to the pbtinstitute.com and join us for the only space to heal and transform physically, mentally, emotionally after betrayal. All research-based, predictable, and proven to move through the five stages from betrayal to breakthrough. Thanks for listening. Can't wait to be with you next time. And here's to your breakthrough.